Welcome to News and Views. My name is Danae Jones and it's my pleasure to bring you this weekly conversational lounge style local news segment that you can watch when you want, where you want, how you want and that's the beauty of social media TV. We encourage you to share it with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. We'll be showcasing local success stories from across the region and we hope you enjoy it. Today we're here at the Pullman Reef Hotel Casino in Bar 36 where they've just completed a multi-million dollar refurbishment. And if you haven't been down here, we strongly encourage you to do so because it really is something quite special. Today we are talking to the Honourable Warren Inch. He's known as the Maverick Federal MP that is not afraid to stand up for what he believes in, even if that means going against the wishes of his own party. He is the one politician that has been fighting for equality for same-sex couples for over 13 years and recently managed to get the Marriage Act changed so same-sex couples could marry in Australia. The amendment to the Marriage Act has attracted international attention and we are joined by the man himself. Welcome to News and Views, Warren. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Donna. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you. So how does it feel? Thirty, well, over 13 years you've been fighting for this. How does it feel to finally have a win of this magnitude? Well, it's quite surreal, actually. I mean, uh, on the evening after it all happened, you've seen lots of celebration and people uh, uh, celebrating the event, and uh, I was invited up to the mural hall. But uh, I went up there and, and I actually had this, really appreciated the, 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 the compliments. But I, I really felt this sense of, I don't know, I, I felt quite flat, you know, it was quite surreal. And um, I sort of broke away from the group and I sat down and this, there was this little gentleman, elderly gentleman with a, quite a large beard watching me in the, uh, just from a little distance and he came over to me when I went on my own and he said, can I shake your hand? And uh, as, I, as I shook his hand, he started to cry. And um, he said to me, you've got no idea. He said, I'm in my late 70s. I never ever thought this would happen. I'm here with my sister. I never ever thought I would be the same as any other Australian. And he said, I just want to say thank you for it. And, and, and you know, the tears were flowing. And, and I said, come here, and I gave him a hug. And he just let go. And he was crying very, 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 very loud. loud. And just sobbing, you know. And uh, I held him for quite a while. And that made me realise, you know, this does have an impact. This has an impact on people's lives. It might be all very well for people to say, oh, well, you know, it's not important or it doesn't matter. There is a lot of people out there that this had a huge impact on, me, on them. And, and uh, I basically, uh, I left then on my own. I, I just went, went back home and uh, had an early night. Um, it wasn't until the next morning when I started to see the reporting and, and, and likes that I suddenly realised, wow, this has really changed our social change like we rarely ever see in this country. And in fact, I was reminded that this is the biggest social change in Australia since the 1967 referendum for Indigenous' right to vote. And when you look at it in that context, you know, it's just amazing and, and I'm really pleased that I have been had the opportunity of, of playing a small role in it. I think it's more than a small role, it's um, quite a remarkable achievement, Warren, Thank and you, you really should be proud of yourself. Um, you know, I, I guess, what do you think that that says uh, to people out there that really want to see social change that is controversial? Um, I guess it really shows that it can happen. Well, it can and it will. I mean, and, and society continues to evolve. And I mean, through this journey, I can remember when I first raised this, going back in the early 2000s, uh, raising concerns about the lack of equity and the you know, discrimination, etc. Not just in the, the marriage element of it, but on legal and financial. Nobody wanted to talk to me about it. I'd stand up in the party room and people would hide their faces, oh no, not this again. Nobody, would, not a single person wanted to talk to me about it. And I, 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 but by raising it and being reported on raising it, well, I copped a fair bit of flack from some saying, I'll get on do something that's real. I mean, believe me, this is real. Um, I also had people come reach out to me and, and, and would say to me, uh, and explain to me some of the challenges. And the more I heard, the more I believed that we had to do this. 
And I recall getting a phone call a few years ago now from a uh, fellow in my office in Canberra and, and uh, he wouldn't tell my staff what he wanted to talk to me about. So they referred him to me and he says, said, said to me, Warren Inch, I said, yes. He said, I'm 50 years old, I li he gave me his name, lives in uh, northern western New South Wales. And he said, I just want to tell you that I'm a gay man. And I thought, where's this going? And I said, yes, okay. And he said, look, I've been seeing the work you've been doing and I just wanted you to be the first to know. And I said, I beg your pardon. And he said, well, I've never been able to talk to my family because of fear of rejection. Same with my community. He said, I I've been holding this back for so long. But what you, the leadership you've shown here has given me the courage to come out and be who I am and I wanted you to be the first person to know and I just want to say thank you, you know. And I thought to myself, I, I had a long chat to him and congratulated him on being true to himself and having the courage to do it. But afterwards I hung up phone and I thought about it and I thought, you know, how sad it is where you've got somebody that has to wait till they're 50 years old to be able to express themselves in who they really are because of fear of rejection, not only from family, but broader society. And I thought, we're better, we are better as a, as a community than that. You know, we always talk about the fair go and all the rest of it in Australia. We're better than that. And, and, and it just reinforced my determination to make it happen. And so do you think the fact that you are, you know, a very self-proclaimed heterosexual male. You're the crop catcher, the bull catcher, you know, you the typical, as you say, tick all the boxes for the typical Aussie redneck. Do you think that's what has actually helped you get this over the Look, line? Just one correction. I've never, ever, ever con con confirmed my sexuality. <laughs> uh, I, I always refuse, whenever I'm asked by the media, I always refuse, and I make the point, my sexuality's got absolutely nothing to do with my advocacy. And I always encourage, you want to see me as heterosexual, please, I encourage you to do that. If somebody wants to have me as a closet gay or a gay, please do it. I'll be quite comfortable with whatever tag you want to do, give me. Because it's been the tags that have been the issue, and up until uh, the articles that were written in the uh, mid-2000s, without any discussion with me, but describing me as fiercely heterosexual, far north Queensland, crocodile farming, bull cats and liberal, tick, 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 uh, showed me the strength of pigeonholing. Because I got, after those articles went out, I got literally thousands of calls. And the majority didn't come from within the gay community. They came from uh, with the families and the friends of, of gay people saying if somebody of your background is prepared to stand up for my gay, gay family member or friend, I want to come out and stand up for them as well. And that was my strength. And uh, it allowed, it, it, I brought a whole different lot of people on board because up until then, uh, you know, the advocacy that was happening was always, was gay people chasing, gay, gay activists chasing for gay reform people, oh, you know, their own, own self-interest, and they would be discard, discounted, and it was slow progress. Whereas with me, they always had to struggle, because some, some, bit cynical, would call me a gay act activist, but many were calling me an activist for the gay community. Yeah. And it, it did make a difference, and, and it really gave a lot of people the encour uh, 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 encouragement to actually reach out to me, somebody that they wouldn't go near in a fit. And you know, I've had so many people, both, both gay and transgender, come to my office and share with me for the first time, you know, their own personal journeys. Um, I had a, trage a, a transgender lady, and, I, and I, I mentioned Kate, who came to me as Colin to do an interview like we're talking about here. And by the time we all finished the interview, I could tell that there was something she needed to tell me. And I said to her, you know, what, yeah, there's something you would like to share. She became very emotional and she said that, you know, she was, she really wanted to trans and, and uh, it was a very, very, you know, emotional interview and by the time she left, she went to shake her head and said, oh, come here, love, give me a hug, you know, As, you know what I'm like, I'm yeah, a hugger. Yeah. And a kiss on the cheek, it was, uh, and, and, and she has stayed with me right through her journey. She was, she was in Canberra last week and she's now 
in the process of transitioning. Uh, my office, and I'll give a big, big shout out to Karen, who's not with, not working with me now, but Heather and Tamara have been rock solid for that girl. And as she's as she's gone through her journey, and she, and one of the things that she came to see me a little while ago, and she was so excited, and she said to me, you know, you're not going to believe this. She said, but Dad called me Kate for the first time, and that was so important to her, you know. So, so it's been people like that that have shared their life, their life stories, which has given me, I guess, the encouragement and the incentive to drive forward. And as I said in an interview the other day, you know, I've been through this marriage stuff before, and I've got to say, I have been a failure in the past. I've been a bit of a bloody disaster. But you know, I got married four and a half years ago, and Yolandi. She is the most gorgeous, the most beautiful woman. And today, she turned 47. So it's oh. her birthday today. But, you know, she is the absolute love of my life. I just absolutely adore her. And, you know, from a marriage perspective, you know, it just doesn't get better. And, and there's not a week goes by and say, I wish I could marry you again, you know? And I think to myself, if there are two people that are committed and love each other as much as Londa and I do, why? should we deny them the opportunity of expressing their love and their commitment for each other in any form that they choose just because of the gender balance. It just doesn't seem right. Yeah. And you know, the fact that they want to express that love and that commitment through the act of marriage has makes no difference whatsoever on my marriage. Yeah. You know, after this law went through, I rang Lons up the next morning. I said, well, darling, we've done it. And I said, do you feel any less married? She said, no, of course not. <laughs> you know, we're still the same. So from that perspective, and I think one of the greatest things that we can celebrate in this country now, we don't have gay marriage. We don't have gay marriage. We've just got marriage, but it's all inclusive, irrespective of gender. And that's something to celebrate. And you know, it's not just a national thing. I have had calls and, 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 and emails congratulating me on my advocacy from New Zealand, from China, from several from different places in Europe, from the UK, from the US, from Uganda, wow. from Uganda. All of these country, people in these countries who have been watching this yeah. and have sent emails through congratulate, congratulating me on this, or on this achievement and congratulating Australia. Hmm. I remember when the ballot came, so when, when the... Uh, well, you were in New York at in the New time. York. So you were actually representing Australia yeah. um, as our ambassador That's for the good. United Nations. A well, not the honor. ambassador. I was, I was seconded to the General Assembly, which, right. which, uh, for, which the General Assembly is in September through, it's a period through for, uh, it usually lasts for about, uh, two to three months, yep. and so I was there. Me and, and, and a, a member from the opposition uh, were over there for that three-month period, and um, uh, which has been great. We, I cut it short by just about two and a half weeks because I wanted to introduce the same-sex marriage bill. And I just make a point that on the night that the, because uh, it was evening, it was six o'clock in the evening when the uh, uh, the uh, plebiscite, the postal plebiscite was uh, uh, determined. And the first thing that happened was the Empire State Building was, was lit up in, light, in, in rainbow colours. We saw it on the yeah, news. Yeah. And the other thing too, I've got to say, is that the, day, the moment that we made the announcement, and this is, this is quite bizarre, you know, I understand that I blocked a lot, all the amendments because I just didn't think they were necessary. But the moment that the announcement was made, my next door neighbours up on my, my other love of my life, my farm, was sitting there watching, watching the decision and Steph looked out the window across, because looking out her window, she looks across my farm, and there was this most massive rainbow, and it was landing smack bang in the middle of my property. Oh wow! And she took a photograph of it, sent it, you know, and I thought, but she said, "Is this, you know, is this a coincidence or is, is it, it a sign? Moment? Is it a sign? You know, yeah. and it was just great." But getting back now to the uh, General Assembly, I made a conscious. I was keen to go over there, 
and I wonder, because I've been working on tuberculosis advocacy. Yeah, for years. Yeah, nobody knows about it. And again, this is another one of these long journeys, right? Yeah. And they, oh, it doesn't really affect one. But what people don't realise uh, and, and is that tuberculosis is the biggest single infectious killer in the world, disease killer. It kills more people than HIV, malaria and Ebola combined. Wow. 1.7 million last year died of it. It's a, it, it, and people say, oh, well, it's a disease of poverty, and yes, it is, you know, and poor ventilation and overcrowding and a range of other but things. But very close to our shores. Well, it's, it's anywhere in the world. It, it's, it's all over the world, and it can be transported anywhere in less than 24 hours. And the only place that there's been no incidence of, of tuberculosis has been in Antarctica. And that's not because of the cold climate, because the Inuits in the north have got it really bad. It's because of the quarantine, because of the research. But there's been very little work done in, uh, up until, because it's always been focused on malaria and HIV. And um, the disease, the treatment of the diseases goes back, um, my mum had tuberculosis in 19, uh, 1962. Um, but the treatments until last year, most of those treatments were, were decades old, the treatments on there. Um, you were required, for example, with drug resistant tuberculosis to take up to 25 tablets a day plus two injections for a year. Wow. Could you imagine being compliant? Yeah. You know, if you're in a remote village where you haven't even... one tablet. Yeah, <laughs> and you've got potable water. Yeah. Haven't got potable water, what chance have you got? Exactly. And so what's happened, of course, because you've been having, because this is an antibiotic, then you've got drug resistant, multi-drug resistant, extensive drug resistant tuberculosis, which is very difficult to cure. Mm. And what's happening now, they're finding that tuberculosis now is jumping across. They've, they've effectively got a vaccine for, tuber for uh, HIV and a treatment where you live a full life. But now TB's jumping on, on board and it's TB that's killing them, not the HIV. Yeah. They're jumping onto malaria victims. They've since found them in, uh, uh, they've found a connection between, HIV, uh, between uh, TB and diabetes because your immune system is weakened and so it jumps in. So there's an urgency there. I don't know, have you got a little scar on your shoulder where you had a... No, I don't actually, but a lot of my friends do. Okay, that is useless as a cup full of cold water. Mm. That was designed in 1921. That was when it was developed and it's useful for a small cohort of children under the age of five. And so the, the urgency is to develop a, 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 a vaccine. vaccine because there hasn't been a content, an infectious disease ever cured without a vaccine. The good news is that he, here in, uh, in Cairns, we ha we are the, we've got the head of the National Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine and James Cook University have put together a great team that are researching on vaccines. Awesome. And so we, we are very keen, and I made them aware of that in the UN. I, and um, I worked with, uh, we've we're now secured a, uh, a high level meeting in um, September next year in the UN. We've got uh, been able to secure Japan and South Africa to host it. And I, I met oh, 70, 80 heads of mission while I was over there, encouraging them to be actively involved. So not surprisingly, most of them had no idea about the threat of TB. And I've got a small secretariat. I'm all actually uh, on the executive of the Global TB Caucus. And, so, and was that as a result of the UN visit? No, I was, that's the reason I went over there because I'm, I'm on that executive. Uh, I've been, as you know, as you know, I've been working on TB now for a long time. I started, uh, I was recruited as a member of the Global HIV Malaria and TB Caucus and I'm the regional uh, representative for, for uh, the Asia Pacific, or co-convener for the Asia Pacific region. I was also uh, the convener for Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the Asia Pacific's got 60% of, um, of the burden of TB. Indonesia, Philippines, Papua New Guinea are shockers. The Marshall Islands has got the highest instance of, popul of, of tuberculosis per head of population in the world. Mm. So uh, it's very close to us, India, Pakistan, China, it's all around us. And so, uh, but it was in my, you know, I, I had the opportunity of going over there as a member of, of Parliament, but I used that then to promote my work that I'm doing in, uh, uh, on TB and uh, it was incredibly successful. I spent some, about a week in, uh, or four days in Washington, uh, going through meeting with congressmen and others over on it. I spent a, a week in Guadalajara, which is in Mexico. They had a TB and lung conference down there, which I spoke. And then I was invited by Harvard University in Boston 
and I travelled up there to speak to their, uh, some of their students from their uh, School of Public Health. I also then went across to the Harvard John F. Kennedy School of Government and I spoke to them. And the first one I spoke predominantly about tuberculosis and the second one I spoke to them in relation to my work on the, my journey in working with the same-sex marriage and political stuff. But I mean, I think of myself, you know, I mean, I, I, I finished school in grade 10. You know, I've got no, no tertiary education. Being invited to go over to and speak at Harvard, you know, one of the most distinguished universities in the world, and to, to talk to a whole group of students over there and have them hanging on to every word that I've spoken, you know, it's just amazing. It, it was an absolute amazing. privilege. Yeah. And so while we're there, also Londi come with me, and Londi's connected up with the, uh, uh, with the UN Women, and she's been working with them to do work both here and in, in PNG. Uh, because she's doing a lot of work in that area as well. And we also connected up with the Global Citizens um, and Londi's also been asked to do some work in there. And I've actually, with you know, the three founders of the Global Citizens, was all young Australians. And um, so I had several meetings with them and they're now looking for a couple of high profile international celebrities that can be the voice of TB. That's fantastic. Isn't it great? It is. You it's know? absolutely fantastic. It's always a pleasure catching up with you, Warren. My pleasure, my dear. Thank you for joining us on News and Views. We look forward to seeing what your next big achievement is. All the best and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. And it's been a pleasure. And there you have it, folks. Our very own Federal Member for Leichhardt making change for all Australians on a national and a global scale. And isn't it refreshing to see a politician really standing up for what he believes in, regardless of the backlash? So refreshing. And uh, we hope to catch up with him again soon. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you next week.